we have a, an exciting group panel today with us Dr. Eamon Asgarpour, Dr. Shirley Abraham, and Richard Weil, members of the team here at Mount Sinai investigating non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Dr. Asgarpour is an assistant professor in the Division of Liver Diseases here at Mount Sinai, completed his fellowship training in gastroenterology and transplant hepatology at Virginia Commonwealth University. Dr. Abraham is an assistant professor of medicine and endocrinology here at Mount Sinai as well. She completed fellowship training in hypertension and lipidology at NYU and a fellowship in endocrinology, diabetes, and metabolism at Johns Hopkins. Richard Weil is an exercise physiologist and certified diabetes educator, and for the past 15 years, he served as director of the Mount Sinai St. Luke's Hospital Weight Loss Program. Please join me in welcoming this impressive group. Good morning, and thanks for having us. Um, I just have to say, you know, I'm uh, in the Division of Liver Diseases, but I like to say I'm a helpatologist. That's a joke my dad loves, so I'm sure it's not that funny. <laughs> yeah. So none of us have any disclosures of the, out of the three of us. And this is a quick outline. So we're going to define non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, fatty liver, and NASH. We're going to we'll talk a little bit about disease initiation, with the predispositions and behavior, and as well as the disease impact. Um, the burden um, with NAFL on liver transplant and hepatocellular carcinoma. Then we're going to talk a little bit about who to refer, patients who have elevated liver chemistries, fatty liver on imaging, and then which diabetic patients we should think about. We have the luxury of having a real endocrinologist with us today to talk a little bit more about that. And then we'll focus on further analysis with uh, non-invasive scoring systems, vibration control, transient elastography, which is the fibro scan. MR and um, elastography, liver biopsy, and then finally, we'll go over some treatments uh, with weight loss, which luckily we have a weight loss expert here today with Rich, and uh, we'll go through some of the clinical trials that have occurred in NASH. So first of all, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is the umbrella. That's all the, that's both fatty liver and NASH. And that's theatosis that's seen on imaging or histology without any significant alcohol use or medications that can cause steatosis. And all you really have to have is a greater than 5% of fat um, to call it a fatty liver. But with just simple fatty liver, there's no um, injury in the form of uh, ballooning or inflammation, really. But NASH, that's the more aggressive form. And that's about 20% of all of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So again, they have greater than 5% fat, but then they have um, cellular injury in the form of the inflammation and hepatocyte ballooning and different degrees of fibrosis. These are the people who can get in trouble. So here at 12 o'clock, we have a pristine liver. And then at 3 o'clock, we have a fatty liver. It looks like fragua. Um, and it's uh, 25 to 30 percent of the population. Um, it varies around the world. So they've done um, this. Uh, the main study was based on 8 million patients all over the United States, Asia, Europe and uh, South America. And we're not the highest prevalence. The highest prevalence is actually in the Middle East at 31%. South America is 30%. And the US, again, is 25%. So then the steatohepatitis, the NASH, it's about 6% of the population. So about 20% of the people who have fatty liver. And of those, 15 to 20% progress to cirrhosis. And all these patients who have fatty liver are at increased risk of cardiovascular death, a liver-related mortality, and cirrhosis on our cirrhotic patients. So histologically, we, we use the uh, NAFLD activity score to get an idea about the gestalt of NASH. And this incorporates steatosis, which is graded from zero to three. And that just depends on the percentage of fat that the, the pathologist sees on a slide. Um, there's also inflammation, which is looking at the different lobular foci on high power field, and uh, ballooning. So, my arm showing up good. So this right here is macrovesicular steatosis, so large droplet steatosis that they're counting. And this right here is a ballooned hepatocyte. It's a deranged hepatocyte with um, derangements in its cytokeratin, uh, and they evade like apoptotic pathways and have signaling cascades which promote disease. And so from this, they developed a scoring system. Um, Kleiner is a pathologist at the NIH um, and involved in the NASH Clinical Research Network. 
and this was further expanded on by Pierre Bedosa out of France to help understand and help pathologists to understand um, how to differentiate the simple steatosis from the more aggressive form at NASH. So you can see you just need some steatosis, so greater than that 5% steatosis to start you off. And ballooning is one of the key features and probably undergraded because it, it only goes from zero to two instead of zero to three. And then you need some um, libular inflammation to really call it NASH. You need a little bit of ballooning and a little bit of inflammation plus the steatosis to really call it uh, NASH, the gestalt of NASH that you see in pathology. So disease initiation. So there are some predisposition that can occur. So PNPLA3 is a very conserved protein um, and it's involved with, a, a, it's a triglycerol lipase um, and it disconnects insulin resistance from NASH. Um, and there's a lot of variability in this phenotype and it's uh, highest actually in the Hispanic population. Um, transmembrane 6 superfamily 2 um, is involved with uh, VLDL transport. So it's, it has, these patients can have trouble getting fat outside, out of the liver uh, in general. But these are just predispositions. They lower your threshold for disease. You still need a disease initiator. So uh, increased uh, adiposity, some uh, steatogenic drugs, TPN, jejun ileal bypass, inflammation, and other genetic disorders can predispose one when you have these other genetic disorders there. Behavior is the most important aspect of this disease, though. An increased weight gain due to dietary excess and sedentary lifestyle are key components in the development of obesity and insulin resistance, and these are critically related to an organ disease. There are many reasons why people are unable to engage in sustained lifestyle changes, and that's why it's really important to you know, think about sending patients to psychologists to unravel um, their eating disorders if they, if they are there. Some people use eating as a coping mechanism, so it's important to have insight uh, so that the, those behaviors can change. And Rich will talk a little bit more about behavior as well. So the pathogenesis of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, so you have a predisposition, a disease initiator that can lead to a phenotype. You have these perpetuating, perpetuating mechanisms behavior, gut microbiome. There's actually changes in the microbiome of NASH patients, more of a shift towards gram-negative rods, which leads to more toll like receptor 4 activation and other cascades. There's metabolic uh, perturbations, and then activation of inflammatory apoptotic and fibrotic pathways. So these are the perpetuating mechanisms. But luckily, luckily there's restorative mechanisms as well. There's stem cell activation, uh, regeneration, um, cell matrix crosstalk, improvements in the microcirculation and metabolic reprogramming. Um, I can go into a whole another lecture about the pathogenesis, which I have, but I'll spare you guys that today. And so with this balance, you can see that some patients can have disease resolution, or they can kind of stay the same, or the disease can get worse. So what's the impact of this disease? So this graph here on the left, um, and the green bars is the total number of liver transplants that occur during the year. And they're, they're on average about five to 6,000. And then over here you can see on the right, that's the total annual liver transplant by etiology. So hep C is still the number one cause of liver transplant in this country. But NASH and alcoholic liver disease are on the rise. And with uh, the new medications for hep C, we expect uh, the, the reason for transplant for hep C to decline even further. <laughs> And you can see between 2008 and 2014, NASH was uh, on the rise, as was alcoholic liver disease. Interestingly, so this was actually a study done by my co-fellow um, uh, just a couple years ago. And what she did was looked at the age population of less than 50 who were getting liver transplants. And NASH actually um, surpassed hep C in that age group. And you can see the full change um, from 2002 to 2014, how hep C is on the decline while NASH is on the rise. So it's, it's definitely a growing problem that we're already becoming evident. And as far as the um, cancer burden, you can see we've done a great job about reducing certain cancers. You know, I, I do a colonoscopy, so I'm happy to see that colon cancer is on the decline. However, liver cancer is on the rise for both men and women. Um, and, and this is from cirrhotic complications mainly and um, NASH becoming a greater burden in our country and around the world. So who to refer? You know, can I get a little help with this? 
So patients who have elevated liver chemistry should be worked up for. Um, this, this slide tends to surprise people. The upper limit of normal of ALT is actually 30 in a male and 19 in a female. In our EPIC um, computer system, um, it says that 45 is the upper limit of normal. And ECW is a system that we use out in uh, Mount Sinai, St. Luke's, and Mount Sinai West. The upper limit of normal is about 70. So you can see it's, it's quite high. Um, so it can go uh, kind of under the radar for a lot of physicians. Um, and so I want to bring this point up to you. Um, and, and this is another uh, important point, that many people who have NAPL um, by C with uh, steatosis seen on imaging, if they have abnormal liver chemistries, that actually increases their likelihood of having NASH, the more aggressive form of this disease. So what evaluation do we do for these patients? So I don't have a blood test, really. I need to rule out other causes of liver disease. And I've seen quite a few patients who have multiple liver diseases, so it's, it's crucial. And as you learn in med school, you got to take a good history. You got to ask them about how much alcohol they're drinking to see if that's the cause or if there are any on, on any medications that can cause uh, steatosis, like methotrexate, tamoxifen, um, long-term steroid use, and amiodarone. And then we check for their hep A and B and C status and vaccinate as, a, um, as needed for hep A and B um, and rule out other diseases like hereditary hemochromatosis, autoimmune hepatitis, Wilson's disease, F1 anatrypsin. And uh, routinely we'll get ultrasounds and if needed we'll do further imaging um, and further work. So what do you do about that incidental um, hepatic cetosis seen on imaging? So all this is based on the new um, ASLD guidelines for NAPL that came out in July. So if you see incidental uh, steatosis, then they, if they have abnormal liver chemistries, then you should work them up as non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Well, if they don't, if they have features of the metabolic syndrome, that actually predisposes them um, to having fatty liver. So you should work them up. If they don't have features of the metabolic syndrome, again, ask them about their alcohol use and if they're on any medications that could cause um, steatosis. So fibrosis is a, a very important aspect of this that isn't really well captured in the NAFL um, activity score. It's actually not captured at all. But fibrosis staging in NASH is a little different than hep C. Um, so F0 is no fibrosis, and F1 is sinusoidal fibrosis. It's just kind of like chicken wire fibrosis you see on the Maison's trichrome uh, stain. It's all this blue you see over here. And then F2 is uh, uh, sinusoidal fibrosis plus periportal fibrosis, and F3 is bridging fibrosis and F4 is cirrhosis. So why am I talking about this? Because it matters. So the degree of fibrosis influences survival. Um, and this is uh, longitudinal data on 300 patients um, based in the United States that they, they watched over time. And you can see as you, you have increasing um, stages of fibrosis, your liver-related mortality increases significantly. And then this just shows that further. So the Prelin study, is the best longitudinal study, um, following patients a minimum of 12 years, but up to 30 years from the United States, Europe, and Asia, as, as well as South America. And I, you know, I talked about a bunch of different histological features. The only one that pans out, actually, is fibrosis when it comes to um, death or uh, liver transplant. In the increasing stage of fibrosis, there's uh, increased uh, hazard ratios. Age also um, played out, so did diabetes and smoking, and statins actually had a protective role. So I will routinely put patients on statins, even though their liver enzymes are mildly elevated, who have NASH because of this reason. Um, you know, I'm a hepatologist, but I calculate AHA risk factors to see if we need primary prophylaxis for our patients as well. So we have some non-invasive scoring systems that we can use to predict the fibrosis. The best validated are the NAFLD fibrosis score and the FIP4 scores, which I'll go into. So, as an online calculator, the NAFLD fibrosis score, um, we can just Google it, um, and then it, it spits out a number for you. But I will, I will warn you that you need to um, notice the albumins in grams per liter, not in grams per deciliter. And so, you can just run through it with this patient. So, it's a 62 year old per, uh, gentleman, for example, who's the BMI of 33, who has diabetes. AST is 30, ALT is 60, billets are 175, and the albumin is 3.4, um, or 34, because it's grams per liter. And so our score is 0 0.87, which is actually, it's a, it's a predictor of presence of advanced fibrosis in this patient, F3, F4. So that's somebody we have to be worried about. You can see 
these numbers, you know, if you look at them quickly, probably don't sound too concerning to most folks, but you know, to me this kind of screams out. I get very worried when I see this. So the FIB4 score, um, it's originally developed for uh, HIV hep C co-infection, but it's been validated for NAFLD as well, well using different cutoffs. And I put a grossly cirrhotic patient here. So age of 65, AST is 45, ALT is 30, so the AST is greater than ALT in this situation. And then there's a thrombocytopenia platelets of 150. So this puts out quite a high score, 3.56. And I would just uh, want to bring to your attention that the cutoffs are much different um, for fatty liver. They're, they're on the lower side, so it's 1.3 and 2.67 here. So these are labs that are always available to you in the computer system that can quickly um, try to risk stratify patients. But in 2014, vibration control transient elastography or fiber scan became FDA approved. Um, and this is a machine that we have that um, is quite portable. We take it to all of our clinics. We have them in all of our liver clinics available to us. And it's a probe that just goes over top of the liver and it just sends a sound wave to, uh, to the liver. And you have a result back in five minutes uh, or less. And it will give you a liver stiffness measurement, um, which will <coughs> estimate fibrosis. And it also gives you a controlled attenuation parameter, which estimates the degree of steatosis in the patients. And we have an M probe um, and then an XL probe for patients who are a little thicker um, to make sure that you're actually capturing the liver. Um, the Europeans joke around and call that the American probe. So. <laughs> and this is, a, I want to bring up the point that when you use a fiber scan, it really, you have to uh, consider the etiology of the disease state that you're looking at because the cutoffs are much different. Um, and so, you know, for us, we're using the NAFLD and NASH um, cutoffs. And the reason I've underlined and highlighted Dr. Afdal here is because he'll be giving grand rounds next month um, right here in this auditorium, so be sure to come. He's an expert, not just in fiber scan, but also in viral hepatology. And so the cutoffs, so this is to understand this degree of steatosis. Um, this is uh, one of the best studies. And what they did was uh, they grabbed 236 diabetic patients who were scheduled to have a liver biopsy that day. They did the fiber scan, marked the spot, and they did the liver biopsy in the exact same spot. Um, and so they were able to compare the scores to the actual pathology. And so the practical cutoffs of that uh, turned out to be 240 for uh, S1 steatosis, 270 for S2 steatosis, and 300 for S3 steatosis. Another modality we have available to us is the MRI with proton density fat fraction and MR elastography. So it's kind of the same concept as the fiber scan, but instead of a little probe, it's a gigantic paddle that goes over the entire level that thumps your entire liver as you go through the MRI machine. And you can see over here on the top, this, uh, this is the um, estimation of fat. So 2.5% fat, 23.3% fat. You can see it gets much lighter um, when there's more um, steatosis that occurs in the liver. And then below here we have um, the elastography which outlines where the liver is and has color coordination here. The numbers are different when you compare it to fiber scan because they use the Young's modulus, but you just multiply by two and a half. So you can see advanced fibrosis, so typically in a fiber scan that'd be 10, 3.6 times 2.5 is 10. Um, so that, that's how we kind of convert back and forth between the two. There's still a role for liver biopsy. Um, I do that myself, so we do them percutaneously on, the, on KCC4. Um, and it's really to make the diagnosis of NASH in certain cases, to think about initiation of drug therapy. So it's really a standard of care to understand the prognosis. And then we can often use that same biopsy to get them into a clinical trial. Um, it's really all about staging the fibrosis and ruling out other causes of liver disease. So this is like the risk stratification um, that we use uh, to think about these NAFL patients. So it's a, a patient with steatosis on imaging, an elevated uh, serum ALT. You've ruled out alcohol and other causes. So then you have NAFL. So then you have a low risk profile. So patients who are non-obese, and again, we, we, so we practice in New York City. We have to be very cognizant of the fact that we have different ethnic groups and there's different BMI cutoffs for those ethnic groups. Um, younger patients, um, patients who don't have type 2 diabetes or, or uh, features of the metabolic syndrome, and low scores on the FIB4 NAFLD fibrosis score or fiber scan, 
These are people you can kind of just follow um, and then think about um, reevaluating in a year or if they start to gain features of metabolic syndrome or other risk factors. And folks who are in the uh, intermediate range, so they're obese, um, over the edge of 40, have features, their scores are kind of in the middle as well. Those are folks who should probably have a liver biopsy to really understand um, their prognosis um, and, and to see if we can get them into clinical trials. And then folks who are kind of more overtly um, having NASH and even features of cirrhosis, those are people who definitely need to be considered for liver biopsy or other testing modalities so we can understand if they're truly cirrhotic. So treatment, um, weight loss is a tried and true and we have some um, pharmacological therapies. So there, there have been a ton of studies with weight loss. Probably the best is out of Cuba. Um, and they, what they did was they had patients who had liver biopsies. They asked them to reduce the caloric intake by three to 500 calories, um, walk a little bit more, and they did another liver biopsy a year later. You can see those who were able to achieve weight loss of 3% or greater could decrease the steatosis in the liver. Those who could lose 5% or greater could decrease ballooning or inflammation. Those who could lose 7% or greater actually would flip over from NASH to just a fatty liver, which is great. What was really astounding was that within a year, if you could lose 10% or more, you could actually cause fibrosis regression as well as everything underneath here. So I show this to a lot of my patients to try to motivate them to lose weight. So here's the current status of pharmacological therapies. There's nothing FDA approved. Um, currently there's some therapeutics for the, with efficacy, but there's many issues. So vitamin E um, and pioglitazone go over. There's more limited data on a beta colic acid and liraglutide. Um, Dr. Abraham will talk more about liraglutide. It's more of in her, her wheelhouse than mine. And there, there's the, still a role of clinical trials. So Pivens is the seminal study um, out of the New England Journal. It was the first uh, study to actually show any efficacy. And they, they looked at non-diabetic patients and gave patients um, pioglitazone, vitamin E, or placebo. And they had liver biopsies at the beginning and then at the end of 96 weeks. So there was overall histological improvement in both vitamin E and pioglitazone, but there's also improvement in the placebo group at about 20%. And resolution of NASH, again, even in the placebo, there was about 20% improvement. Um, and vitamin E, there was, you know, statistically significant. Pioglitazone was also a statistically significant difference compared to placebo, but not that much better. And they all have some issues. So there's uh, an issue of potential prostate cancer, all-cause mortality, and hemorrhagic strokes of vitamin E. And uh, pioglitazone does have the issues of weight gain, uh, heart fail failure, and possible osteopenia. And we've seen um, throughout all the studies quite a high placebo effect, um, anywhere between 10 and 20 percent. Um, while that can be discouraging, I'm a glasses half full kind of guy, so I tell my patients, hey, even if you're in the placebo group, one in five of you is going to improve, and that's, our goal is to, you, for you to improve, not for me to uh, make the pharmaceutical companies happy. So that's actually a motivator for me. A beta, beta colic acid. Um, was another big study that came out in 2015. So this is an FXR agonist. So it, this is a kind of a tweak bile acid to activate the nuclear receptor for bile acids, FXR. So they did a double-blinded study. Um, they had patients who had, who had NASH um, non serotics and they gave them beta colic acid or placebo. And again, you can see that there was improvements of 45%, but even the placebo had improvements in, in 21%, but there was also a fibrosis signature here, so there was improvements not just in uh, the histological features of ballooning and inflammation, but also in fibrosis. But again, the placebo effect is about 20%. The major um, adverse issues with this medication was there was significant puritis, and you could actually tell who was on this medication because their LDLs would all increase. Um, they'd have decreases in HDL. So we put, all, um, we put these patients on statins, and they did okay from that perspective, but that was enough for them to go on to a phase three trial, so they're in the middle of the phase tr three trial now, um, and they, they're trying a lower dose of a beta colic acid to get um, past those side effects, but as you can see, it's planned for six years, so it's going to take a long time um, to see if this is actually going to be a beneficial medication for us to use, and a lot of the phase three trials are going to three years, or, or sorry, are going to six years. Um, so it's going to take a while for us to figure out which medications truly work on these patients. 
And this is just to give you an idea of the landscape of the active NASH trial. So there's over 123 here in the United States. We have several ongoing clinical trials here at NASH, uh, for NASH, um, and many are actively recruiting. Uh, right now we just have F2 to F4. Um, sometimes we'll have some F1 fibrosis uh, NASH studies as well. And we have about four more that are coming online in the next couple months. So there are definitely options available for us. And again, this is something that we do in conjunction um, with the standard of care liver biopsy. We use the same biopsy to see if they can get into a clinical trial if the patient's willing to do so. We can give them increased access to healthcare um, by doing so as well. So what's new? Um, there's a referral for fiber scan and beta testing, and one of your co-residents, Robert Dewar, is helping out significantly on this. Um, it's not quite ready for prime time, but we're hoping it'll be ready for prime time in the next couple weeks. Um, we're also working on dot phrases, uh, so that NAFLD fibrosis score, the FIP4 score, uh, for you guys to easily use in clinic to help it stratify. And we were going to have it set up so it just spits out um, not just the number, but it, it interprets it for you to give you an idea of what to do. So that's something that we're actively working on. Just to give you an idea that we're kind of everywhere. Um, so I have clinics at Mount Sinai St. Luke's, Mount Sinai West, over in CAM and over at the FPA. And we have a fiber scan in all of these locations. There's always a fiber scan available in CAM for you. Um, so we'll be able to help risk stratify those patients uh, and give them the appropriate care. So if you send me a patient for a fibro scan, um, it'll get done that day, and then a hepatologist will go in the room and, de and describe the findings of the patient right there in real time, and we'll come up with a game plan as to refer them back to you guys or have them officially see us in clinic. So we'll risk stratify them ourselves. So thank you guys very much. I'd like to introduce uh, Shirley Abraham from the Division of Endocrinology. Good morning. Uh, thank you for inviting me to collaborate on uh, both uh, clinically and also uh, with this talk. So with increasing rates of obesity and type 2 diabetes, we're seeing more fatty liver disease, and we know that there are common conditions with established NAFLD association, as well as dyslipidemia, metabolic syndrome, and polycystic ovarian syndrome. We also know that there are other conditions associated with NAFLD, and the mechanisms are less clear. With metabolic syndrome, if you have three or more of the following features that qualifies for metabolic syndrome, including obesity with the waist circumference greater than 35 inches in women or 40 inches in men, and that's different based on the racial and ethnic background of the patient, hypertension with the blood pressure greater than 130 over 85 or on blood pressure medications, hypertriglyceridemia with triglycerides greater than 150 or on medications, dyslipidemia with an HDL less than 40 in men or less than 50 in women, and uh, insulin resistance with impaired fasting blood glucose or on diabetes medications. With increasing number of metabolic syndrome features, we find that there's also increasing rate of diagnosis of NASH. So we see that as the rate of the number of metabolic syndrome features, and we get to three, so we're reaching um, the diagnosis for metabolic syndrome, we see higher rates of definite confirmed NASH. In patients with type 2 diabetes, they have an increased risk of both NAFLD and NASH. We can risk stratify using the risk calculators that were shown, the NAFLD fibrosis score and the FIB4 uh, calculator, and also um, to use them as decision um, AIDS, and then also using imaging, using the VCTE or fiber scan or MR elastography, which are clinically useful tools for identifying advanced fibrosis in patients with NAFLD. In this study that was done to look at 100 patients in San Diego with type 2 diabetes, they examined them with MR. Uh, MRI looking at the fat fraction and the elastography, and they found that when they were screening for NAFLD, they had a um, MRI fat fraction greater than or equal to 5%, meaning NAFLD in 65% of these patients. And then when screening for advanced fibrosis, looking at the MRE um, stiffness, they found advanced fibrosis in 7.1%. 
When we examined um, our patients in the Mount Sinai Diabetes Center, we looked at 40 um, patients with type 2 diabetes and found that there was NAFLD in 80% of those patients. And then when we examined for ex uh, advanced fibrosis, we found that there was um, advanced fibrosis in 12.5% of our patients. So we can see that we have even higher rates than the previous study. What can be done to treat their um, fatty liver disease? It's medications that can improve their diabetes and obesity. So one that was examined in this study, the lean study, examined liraglutide, 1.8 milligrams, for 48 weeks. And that's a GLP-1 agonist that will um, increase satiety and also binding to endogenous um, GLP-1 receptors will also increase insulin secretion, which decreases um, A1C, and also there's uh, weight reduction. So in this randomized double-blind trial of overweight patients with NASH, including patients with diabetes, there was a resolution of NASH in 39% of the patients who were on the liraglutide group, and improved ballooning in 61% of these patients, and there was no worsening of the fibrosis. So this is promising to see um, medications that can be used to treat diabetes and obesity can also be used to reverse NASH. That was fast. Uh, okay, um, so I'm gonna talk about the weight loss program. Um, we're at uh, St. Luke's on the west side. Um, this is an overview of what we do. There are, um, it's a 52-week program. There are group sessions. There's 20 people in a group. Um, it is lifestyle change, so there's no medication or surgery. Um, BM, the criteria inclusion is a BMI over 30 for one part of our program, and we recently started a program for people who have less than uh, BMI of less than 30, and those are 26 weekly sessions. Um, men and women over 25, the groups are closed, so it means that the same people are with each other for the entire 52 weeks, so there's the most support and uh, 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 cohesion for the group support. Social support is very important for, uh, for weight loss. So we have staff of RDs, um, behavior leader, usually a therapist, a psychologist, social worker, life coach, um, exercise physiology. Um, so they alternate in. We have a greater emphasis on the behavior part, so the behavior leader is there most of the time um, in the sessions, and they're at 75 minutes. I, I didn't have that up there. And then we have an ongoing follow-up program after the first year that goes in modules of three months at a time, and this is ongoing. So we have people in the program seven or eight years at this point. They just keep renewing after the first year, so follow-up's really important. Um, you'll see the average BMI in a minute and why we um, why we have an ongoing program and we treat it as a chronic disease. Um, patients pay out of pocket for uh, $60 per week um, and we don't accept insurance, although insurance companies are getting a little better at starting to cover this. Some people are getting 50%, some are getting after the first $1,000, um, it gets covered. Um, the process is um, this for enrollment. They attend an orientation session, which is a free information session. They find out about us from uh, referrals from their physician, word of mouth, and the website. Um, they come for an individual screening if they're still interested after the orientation. That's an, uh, an appointment with me. And we go over them in more detail and make an effort to determine if this is really the program they want to commit to. Because it is 52 weeks and we're dependent on those groups um, staying cohesive. If we have a group of eight at the end, it's not so helpful. Our attrition is very low. We lose fewer than 18% at this point of a 20 group, 20 person group. We've had three groups that started with 20 and ended with 20, which is outstanding, I must say, blow my own horn here. We're doing really well with that. It used to be 33% in the first seven and a half years of the program, but we got better at doing it. Um, and uh, uh, people come because they, uh, they feel connected. That's part of the reason we have such good attrition. Um, so here's the descriptive data. This is 976 patients over the last 15 years. You can see the, um, the 
uh, female and male ratio. Um, this has changed. It used to be m many more women. It used to be about 85% women, and that's decreasing as more men sort of, we, we believe it's just the men are reaching out more, whereas they didn't think it was a problem before they were embarrassed or whatever it was. Um, the average age is 47. Um, uh, baseline BMI is 43.1 with a range up to 88 and a half. Um, so we have some very heavy people up to 500 pounds. Um, we also find that those 500 pounders don't lose any weight. Um, we're not successful at helping them. How you can have a 500 pound person gain a few pounds after 52 weeks is, it's just a different disease that we're treating and we don't understand it well enough. It's, it's, it's very difficult. They're trapped inside this body of theirs and they simply cannot lose weight. As much as we make individual intervention, group intervention, they just, they just can't lose weight. Um, the average baseline weight is for men 312 pounds, women 251 pounds, and here you see the uh, breakdown by race. Um, this has remained pretty consistent over the 15 years. Um, so the intervention um, is lifestyle change, as I said, so we have, we, fundamental is uh, cognitive behavior therapy. Um, we have dozens of strategies. I put up just some of the ones that we do all the time. Goal setting, relapse prevention, problem solving. Problem solving has uh, been shown many times over to be very successful for helping people lose weight and more importantly maintain weight. Data from the National Weight Control Registry shows that people are always problem solving. Um, impulse control, eating restraint, assertiveness, and so forth. A lot of people come up to me after and say, you know, the stuff I'm learning in this program is really helpful for weight loss, but it's really helping me in a lot of areas of my life um, and relationships. So, uh, yeah. So we're pleased with that. We're, we're proud of that. So um, here's the uh, nutrition um, component. Um, it's a 500 to 1,000 calorie day deficit food plan. So one to two pounds per week. If you get people, um, who want to lose more than two pounds a week, you have to really do the math and figure out how are they going to cut out 1,500 calories a day. You know, that's really hard to do. They're going to walk around hungry. We don't want people to feel hungry. We don't want people to feel restricted or deprived. If they do, they're going to rebound and they're always going to eat more. And they've all come to us from restrictive diets, every one of them, and it just doesn't work and that's why they show up. So we don't want to do that. Um, so we restrict uh, total dietary fat content to less than 30% of the caloric intake with less than 10% from saturated fats, carbohydrate 40 to 45% of caloric intake. And this is now consistent with what we're finding with NAFLD. You know, we, in the obesity field, we never talked about NAFLD ever when Amon came to me and approached me about doing the study we're doing. Uh, we had to read up on it. No one, none of my colleagues, we really haven't been following the data. So now we know that carbohydrate intake is really important, and fructose in particular. So we're limiting that. And then protein, 20 to 30 percent. Um, physical activity, we do lifestyle physical activity first. If you have people with BMIs of 40 or 50 or 60 and you go in there and you tell them to start training for the marathon, they're going to turn away from you very quickly. So we're really more talking about um, just observing how you move or don't move through this world. Do you take a bus two blocks or three blocks and how to start to make intentional changes in their physical activity. That's what we do first. Then as they lose weight, it gets easier to move. And then we start to talk about more formal aerobic exercise as per the American Colleges sports medicine, which is five days a week, 30 minutes of moderate, or three days a week of 20 to 60 minutes vigorous. And this can be accumulated in bouts of 10 minutes during the day, three times, or two 15-minute bouts. So it's, it's more uh, accepted by them. And then resistance exercise, it was added recently, and that's two or more days per week. And we use rubber bands and so forth. And this is really easy for them to do. They can do it at home. They can do it while seated. So it's something intentional that they're doing to build muscle. When you lose weight, you, lose, you can lose up to 35% of your weight from muscle. So maintaining that muscle during weight loss is a really helpful, important thing to do. Um, you know, there are compensatory mechanisms that try to defeat weight loss, and one of them is a loss of muscle and loss of uh, metabolic rate. So if we can preserve some of that with um, resistance mm -hmm. exercise, which is easy for them to do, we're, we're going to help them. So the outcomes. So um, um, our average weight loss for overall is 8.8%. The women lose more weight than the men. Um, and uh, that's not what is commonly believed, but that's what we find. And then you see standard deviation and median. But the range is what I want to point out to you. We lose anywhere from 39.9% to a gain of 11.5% overall. And then you can see uh, the male and female breakdown. So there's a huge range, um, and I'll illustrate that a little bit better in a moment. So our biggest loser
loser was 112 and a half pounds in 52 weeks, and this was a woman in her 50s whose hot flashes were so hot that I could feel them from across the room. So it's really a myth that women going through menopause cannot lose weight. In fact, women in their late 50s, early 60s in our program lose the most weight. And we think it's because they're more mature. Frequently in the screening, what they'll say to me, almost all of them, is their kids are off to school, they're ready to take care of themselves. They've been the caretaker all along. They still have one child at home, their husband, but they, <laughs> they, they learn to deal with that after 35 years of marriage. Um, just for perspective, this is what 112 pounds looks like. This is what she was carrying around with her. And by the way, for every pound you lose, it's four pounds less stress off your joints. So she lost more than 440 pounds of stress off her joints. Um, so this is um, the most perplexing part of our work. 92, this is um, each individual, there's 627 here. This is um, weight loss on the y-axis and the participants. So it's very condensed because there's so many people. 92% of the people lose weight in our program, 8% gain weight. And you would ask people, why do you stay in a 52-week weight loss program if you're gaining weight? And they'll almost always say the same thing, that they were gaining a lot more weight than that when they started, and so that we've arrested the weight gain, and that's why they're pleased to do it. Plus, we're very funny and very smart and good looking, so they like to come and see us. <laughs> so um, I should tell you, though, that in all studies of weight loss, no matter what it is, and this is a drug trial, the graph looks the same. So this was a placebo, this is promontide, and promontide plus cybutramine, uh, which was taken off the market mm -hmm. shortly of this publication. And then even with phenamine, which is an amphetamine, where you get a lot of weight loss, even that, you see that graph. So we're right in the line where it is. We'd like to change this. We work really hard to do it, but it's not easy. So this is um, the standard thing that happens. These are each line is a group, and you can see at week 26 or so the line starts to flatten out. Some groups lose more than others, but for the most part, we see the plateau at week 26, and we're thinking really hard about that and what to do. But there's certainly an interaction here between the psychology of weight loss and the biology of it, and this mandatory almost plateau that you see. Um, and um, just to put a nod in for us, this is Weight Watchers data, and what you can see is after week 26, they gain weight back, so we're doing better than Weight Watchers. Um, so uh, predictors of weight loss, so I spend a lot of time thinking about psychological predictors of weight loss. These are just some of the variables that we have measured. I have students who all they do all day is sit there and crunch numbers for me looking for some trace of something that we can do as the holy grail to say, here's this survey, complete it, and we'll be able to tell you, predict how well you're going to do. And we spend a lot of time doing that. And then um, I have them um, identify which ones uh, meet a criteria where we're going to further investigate. So everything in yellow is something that we want to look at more. The R squared is good and the p-value is, is good. Um, I selected just a few to give you a flavor of our predictors. So baseline BMI does not predict weight loss, contrary to what everybody would think, the heavier people lose the most, it's not true. So what we see from this is that it's a level playing field. Anybody can lose as much weight as they want, and we reiterate that a lot with our folks. Um, attendance is probably our best predictor. Um, and there's always a question of causality. Are they showing up because they're losing weight or are they losing weight because they're showing up? This graph doesn't tell us that. Um, informally, anecdotally, it seems as though um, they sometimes don't show up when they're not doing very well, but that seems to be less than 10% of the population when I've asked them anonymously. Um, only about 10% are not showing up when they're pissed off and they can't lose weight or whatever it is, right? Um, um, as I said, this is, um, shows the, um, uh, the weight loss by age, and you can see 50 to 59 and 60 to 69-year-olds. It used to be 50 to 59s exclusively more, but now we're creeping up, and uh, people maybe are getting older as they're coming to the program. Um, uh, so I just chose this one just again to give you just a little flavor. So it's improving emotional eating is positively associated with percent weight change at week 52. And if you went into our program and asked any hundred of the 140 participants, they'd all say that they eat in response to high emotional arousal. Um, they eat when they're depressed, they eat when they're sad, they eat when they're angry, they eat when they're happy. They eat in all response to many different factors. So we find that's a real good predictor and so we deal a lot with that in the program. Um, and then um, finally, um, quality of life improves. This is a quality of life scale specifically for weight loss, so it asks questions like, can you bend over and tie your shoes? 
and um, we get a 22% increase. Um, but keep in mind that the score goes up to 155, the range, and we're only at 114. So their quality of life is about halfway where we'd like, or I guess a third, two thirds of the way there, but we'd still like to improve it more. So we have follow-up data. Um, the question was, we sent it out by email, a mass email to graduates. Do you currently weigh more or less or about the same within 12, 10 pounds since the day you completed the year 152-week program? And 39.4% reported about the same. 28% said they were gaining weight and 32% said less. So there is an argument for self-selection in uh, follow-up data. Um, that only the responders, positive responders, are going to do a uh, reply, but in fact, um, 28% of them are weighing more, so we feel like this is about as good as it gets. Um, so we, um, uh, uh, we are doing this fatty liver study now with the hepatology team over here. Um, we're using the fiber scan. We're measuring them at baseline four months, eight months, and 12 months. And um, we just started it. We just have a few um, uh, who have completed the, the second phase four months. Um, but um, what we found was, <clears throat> of the 50 we've scanned at the beginning, 72% um, had an apple D, 24% um, NASH, um, greater scores over seven and a half, and advanced fibrosis, 14%. So we're going to look at the effect of weight loss on this. So I have very preliminary data with just a sample size of seven. And um, this is the percent weight change at four months in seven patients versus their CAP score. And um, it's statistically significant, and it's a very high R squared. This is not an outlier, we don't feel, because um, he represents 14% of the population. If we take him out, the R squared does get, get lower. Um, 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 but uh, we're, we're confident that we're going to see more of this. And then um, the weight change or fibrosis score, um, the percent weight change from baseline to four months is not statistically significant yet, but again, it's only seven patients. Um, somebody mentioned about motivation. We find that um, some of our patients are really motivated. We had a fellow, he's lost 20% of his body weight after four months, 52 pounds, and his score has decreased, his fibrosis score has uh, decreased quite a bit, so we're very excited about that. And finally, I just want to thank our patients. This is uh, at the Corporate Challenge. It's a three and a half mile run walk in Central Park. Um, our average BMI was 40.6. Um, we're always the slowest in the field. Two years ago, they were taking the finish line down when we got done, most of our people. And because we were screaming and carrying on so much, they let us hold the clock so that our last people yeah. come clip clopping in at the end. So just give a nod to them. Thanks. So I don't know if there's a clear number for that, but I'll, I will tell you that anecdotally, last week alone, I saw two patients um, who have a new diagnosis of NASH cirrhosis who are diabetics who told me, Doc, they've been telling me I had fatty liver disease for over 20 years. Why didn't anybody ever send me to you? And, and that's because they had low level uh, ASD ALT elevations um, and nobody was really noticing that their platelets were starting to tank. Um, I'm, I'm not sure of the, the clear number there, but of the, you know, the estimate of diabetics in this country is 9% and the um, estimated fatty liver disease burden in this country is 25%. So uh, you know, I, don't, I don't think there's a clear understanding of how many of these diabetics truly have um, cirrhosis, but we do see it quite a bit. Could you comment on what seems to be controversial related to the role of fructose in the development of NASH? So I'll, I'll tell you the first thing I tell my patients to do is to cut out um, high fructose corn syrup drinks out of their diets um, and to watch their empty calories uh, from their drinks. Um, I, I'm also a, a translational researcher, so I used to do a lot of mouse models. So again, we're extrapolating from mice. We had some mice that we just gave um, high fat diet to, and they would get some fatty liver. As soon as we added high fructose corn syrup to their water in a very low amount, much less that's in your sugary sodas, they got rip roaring NASH um, in eight weeks, and uh, the incidence of HEC uh, skyrocketed in those mice. So um, I, I don't think we, we clearly understand that 
in humans, but it does seem that the obesity epidemic does parallel um, the high fructose corn syrup incidence in this country. How difficult is it to actually uh, live on a low fructose diet, given the nature of our agricultural and food? There, there are a lot of corn subsidies, absolutely. Um, I, th I, think it's, I think it's difficult, um, but I'll tell you that I used to drink a can of uh, Coca-Cola every day for lunch, and as soon as my mice started getting sick, I quit. Um, so it's possible, and I wanted to practice what I actually preached. So uh, since I've started working here in July, I, I lost five, or uh, sorry, I lost 15 pounds um, just following the, the recommendations I give to my patients about portion control and things that I've learned um, with our diabetologist about the plate size, et cetera. Um, and cutting out the high fructose corn syrup and bringing up juice to patients. A lot of them think the juice is healthy and just letting them know that that's loaded in high fructose and empty calories is, is truly important. You know, I just wanted to add one thing about sugar and this because we find it really addictive and people come in, they're drinking soda, it takes uh, three to seven days for them to stop if they can. and. Um, uh, they lose weight almost immediately as soon as they do it, but it's very difficult for them to stop doing it. Yeah. So the uh, gut microbiome has been extensively <clears throat> studied in obesity. And it was mentioned uh, in the beginning that it also plays a role in NASH. Do you know if the organisms are in any way similar between the two different entities? You know, there, there, are, there are shifts in um, gram-negative and um, shifts in the firmicutes and the bacteroides populations, uh, and they're actually using that as a form for diagnosis. There was a, a nice paper out in Cell last year uh, that looks at that change in microbiome to actually predict uh, advanced fibrosis in patients. But, I, you know, while I appreciate the, the work that's ongoing in the microbiome, I think we're still at our infancy in our understanding of the microbiome. The prevalence of NASH, as you mentioned, 25%. Are there any guidelines to screening? So that, that's what I hope I went over earlier. So yeah, okay. um, yeah. So uh, maybe it came in late, but uh, it'll be available online. Um, no, we definitely need to think about. So fatty liver is 25%, and NASH, the more aggressive, is more like five or six percent of the U.S. population. But using the non-invasive calculators. Um, really paying attention. The, the one thing if you had to look at is platelets. If you saw platelets going down, you really need to be worried about that patient um, developing portal hypertension, splenomegaly, and complications of portal hypertension. Um, but yeah, the Nafold fibrosis score, the FIB4 score, or the uh, fiber scan are quick, easy tools for us to use to risk gratify patients. And I have to say, also with diabetes, we always think of everything from their eyes to their toes, and now we're starting to realize more we have to focus on their um, visceral fat and also their abdominal obesity and their uh, fatty liver as well. So it becomes one more thing to think about when we think about obesity and diabetes and how it affects them um, throughout their entire body. So in the pediglutazone, vitamin E placebo study. You said that 20% of those getting a placebo actually had improvement. Do you know if they um, were changing their diets, if they were taking a new medicine? Why did they lose, uh, uh, why did they improve if they didn't get any drug? It's a great question. Um, and we, we see that a lot with the placebos. There, there were no new medications. You know, that was uh, highly monitored, so there were no new uh, medications that way. But everybody was encouraged um, to, to work on weight loss with diet and exercise. And I kind of call this the dentist effect. Um, I know before I go to the dentist, I tend to brush the heck out of my teeth a little bit better than I normally do. And so if you have increased access to health care, um, seeing the physician more regularly because you're part of a clinical trial and you're um, getting cutting edge technology, uh, for example, the MRI with PDFF, if we can offer those things to you and um, give you some other incentives and metrics. Um, we think that's the role, but uh, that's an ongoing um, kind of debate in the liver forum right now as to why our placebo groups are so high. But like I said earlier, I'll take it. Um, my, my obligation is, in, uh, is to my patients, so I want them to improve. Okay, last question. Do you have any data on the use of phenofibrate to lower the 
Right. It definitely works to lower the triglyceride levels, but it doesn't, um, it hasn't shown to pan out to actually help with the overall NASH. Okay, let's thank our speaker.